Bueno, identifique. Please state your name. Uh, my name is Philip Ag. I live in Hamburg, Germany, and I'm here for the festival and for other activities. Uh, it's the fifth visit to Cuba in the last 12 months for me. Eh, conocemos que, que fue usted invitado por el Movimiento por la Paz y la Soberanía de los Pueblos eh, porque iba a publicar un ensayo sobre la guerra de la CIA contra el Che. Well, yes, uh, some people here may not know the bad news, and that is that I was in the CIA in the 1950s and 1960s, uh, leaving in 1968. But the good news is that I've been working very closely in solidarity with Cuba for the last 25 years, and I hope that that uh, compenses somewhat. It happens that uh, in preparation for coming for the uh, festival, I wrote an essay recalling as much as I possibly could on the CIA's great fear of Che in the 1960s uh, and of the measures that the CIA had taken through these years against Che until the time of his death in Bolivia. This essay includes the fact that uh, Che first came to the attention of the CIA in Guatemala in 1954. Guatemala at that time, for those who do not know the history, was the most progressive country in Latin America. Some would argue that the reform programs underway in Guatemala, which the Guatemalans called the October Revolution, which dated from the overthrow of a military dictatorship in the 1940s, was the most progressive movement really in the history of Latin America since the conquest at that time. This was agrarian reform, it was educational reform, It was the inclusion of the indigenous population of Guatemala, emphasis on women's rights as well. And so Guatemala City became a mecca for political activists in Latin America of that time. Che had just finished a medical school in Buenos Aires, and he made his way to Guatemala City, city arriving around the end of 1953. For the next six months, Che lived firsthand the CIA efforts, CIA's efforts in the Eisenhower administration to stop the Guatemalan process. That is to overthrow the government and establish a military dictatorship that would turn back the clock in Guatemala and restore lands to the United Fruit Company of Boston that had been confiscated as a part of the reform program. Che never forgot the Guatemalan experience. And one of the things that he learned and applied later on was the need to arm the people to defend the revolution that is taking place for their benefit. That was the era as Che saw it, and many others did too, of what happened in Guatemala because the CIA was successful in the summer of 1954 in overthrowing the Guatemalan government. They then established a military dictatorship and that dictatorship has continued really until our time in the 1990s. No one knows how many people have been assassinated, tortured to death, and disappeared through the use of terror as an instrument of state policy since that CIA action in 1954. Some say 100,000, others say 150,000, others say 200,000. The truth is, no one will ever know how many people have disappeared and been tortured to death and assassinated because of the CIA's successful, for them, operation in 1954. We've heard an awful lot this morning about the CIA as an arm of state terror of the United States of America. 
I would like in these few moments that I have, if I may, to place some of this activity into a context. One thing we should always remember is that we can never forget this history. In fact, we should be studying day by day the history as it unfolds and as, as it had occurred in the past of the United States as the power that by far has used state terror as an instrument of foreign policy and of domestic policy as well through this 20th century. <coughs> We should study this history and follow it as it unfolds in our lifetimes because it is an instrument that will always be used by the United States until there are fundamental and revolutionary changes within the United States themselves. After World War II, the United States decided that it needed a national intelligence service. It had never had a national civilian intelligence service before. The purpose was to collect information from around the world and to use the information in secret ways in order to influence the course of events in other countries. The collection of information is called the intelligence process in this business. And the use of the information to influence events is known as covert action or secret operations. Among the different types of covert actions is the CIA's influence, and by the way, the CIA was established as the instrument to carry out this policy. Among the types of ways in which the CIA has been used over 50 years now, this is the 50th anniversary of the establishment of the CIA, is through the recruitment of political leaders and government leaders, military leaders, statesmen of all sorts, trade unionists. These are the ways in which the CIA seeks to penetrate and manipulate the institutions of power of other countries. Included, of course, are youth and student organizations. These are considered very important because the youth of the world and the student population are the future leaders. And so the CIA from the beginning has always focused on youth and students as an area of great importance to their future operations. Women's organizations as well, churches and religious organizations professional and cultural societies. I believe I mentioned trade unions. All of these institutions, generically all around the world, have been targets for penetration and manipulation by the CIA. One of the most important sectors has also been the public information media, press, radio, and television. As we've already heard here this morning, Radio has been very important in the CIA's operations against Cuba. Radio has been used in, the, uh, in Asia, in Europe, <coughs> and wherever it was necessary in the world. Press. In Latin America, in my time in the 1960s in the CIA, we had journalists working for us on our payroll who were taking our material and publishing it under their name as if, as if it were their own material. They were, in other words, mercenary journalists. One other category of covert actions is known in the CIA as paramilitary operations. Paramilitary operations combined with political action and propaganda is what the CIA exercised in Guatemala in 1954. I was involved in these types of operations in Ecuador in the 1960s. And I'll give one example of the use of a type of terrorism. 
At the age of 25, I went down to Ecuador, undercover in the United States Embassy in Quito as a political attaché. Our main goal was to induce or force the Ecuadorian government to break commercial and diplomatic relations with Cuba, as was the principal CIA program all over Latin America. The Cuban Revolution, through its overthrow of the Batista dictatorship and its immediate reform programs, such as agrarian reform, the urban reform programs, and other processes that were taking place in this country, reached out into every corner of Latin America. And it was directly opposed to all United States interests throughout the region. The goal first of the Eisenhower administration and continued by the Kennedy administration was to isolate Cuba, <coughs> thereby neutralizing the influence of the Cuban Revolution. We worked very hard in the CIA to bring about the isolation of Cuba through the breaking of diplomatic and commercial relations with Cuba, through the restriction of travel to Cuba, through provocations, provocations against Cuban officials who traveled through Latin America. And in 1960, when I went down to Ecuador, there was a new administration which refused to take any action to break relations with Cuba. We had many forces on our side, on the right of the political spectrum, and through these forces we were to, able to organize chaos. Knowing that the Latin American milita military tradition was that when chaos occurred socially and politically, the chances are that the military would intervene, supposedly to establish or reestablish order. And so we fomented street demonstrations. We had a barrage of propaganda against the government coming out because they refused to break relations with Cuba. One government fell because of this program of ours. It was the government of Jose Maria Velasco Ibarra. He was overthrown by the military and the vice president came in as president. He too refused to break with Cuba. And so we organized a series of provocations which included the bombing of Catholic churches in the principal cities around the country. These bombings were carried out by our allies on the extreme right. They did not do very much damage, but they did cause a lot of noise and they served more as a propaganda tool than as something to cause damage to these churches. First there was a bombing in one city, then another city, then another city. And at each bombing, our friends left behind leaflets supporting Cuba and attributed to the Ecuadorian Union of Revolutionary Youth. This was one of the principal youth organizations, it was the principal youth organization that supported the Cuban Revolution. <coughs> we falsely attributed these bombings to this revol revolutionary youth organization. And then we financed buses and trucks to go out to the countryside and pick up campesinos by the thousands and bring them into the city where we would have a mass demonstration of, the, of support to the Catholic Church and of, of rejection of Cuba and the Cuban Revolution. These bombings went on over a period of months until finally we reached Quito, the capital city. And there the bomb was placed in the residence of the Cardinal. Of course, the same leaflets were left behind. And by the way, we printed these leaflets ourselves and wrote the message in praise of the Cuban Revolution and calling for the overthrow of the government and establishment of a Cuban-style revolution and revolutionary government in Ecuador. We had a clandestine printing plant 
And we even had the print shop symbol of the print shop of the Communist Party of Ecuador. And so these leaflets that were spread all over looked very authentic. After the bombing in the Cardinal's residence, naturally there was another huge manifestation of support to the Catholic Church, which we financed, as we did everywhere. And the moment arrived in which the main Ecuadorian military garrison, which is in the south of the, of the country near the Peruvian border, because of their problems, revolted. And they gave the president 24 hours to break relations with Cuba or to follow the pre previous president, Velasco, into exile in Panama. Arosemena broke and remained as president. So we were successful. But it was the use of this tool of terrorism to intimidate the civilian population, to provoke support for the church, to provoke also denunciations of Cuba, and finally to provoke the military in, uh, intervention, which was the successful tool at that time. Later on, after I had worked in Ecuador, I went to Uruguay. And by that time, it was uh, late March of 1964. The CIA's program in Brazil, which had been going on for two or three years to overthrow the Goulart government, and which also included acts of terrorism, had just been successful. Because at the end of Brazil, I mean, at the end of March, the Brazilian military intervened, <coughs> overthrew the civilian government, the elected civilian government of Jean Goulart, and immediately within days, I think, or if not hours, broke relations with Cuba, which was our main reason for a two or three year long series of operations to overthrow the civilian government. <coughs> because Goulart would not break with Cuba. I arrived in Montevideo, Uruguay, just at the time of the coup d'etat against Goulart. And suddenly there were Brazilian exiles coming into Montevideo in large numbers. And our job was to control the movements and activities of these Brazilian exiles among other things, reporting back to Rio de Janeiro, the main station in Brazil. <coughs> but our main job, and I was in charge of these anti-Cuban operations in Uruguay, as I was in Ecuador before, was to force a break in diplomatic relations again. Because by that time, only Uruguay, Chile, Bolivia, and Mexico still had diplomatic relations with Cuba. And we wanted to make it continent-wide. This was not just a CIA program, it was the whole United States government program against Cuba in Latin America. We were successful. The Organization, organization of, United, of um, American States, OAS, met in the summer of 1964 and in a sense ordered all the remaining members who, which had not broken with Cuba then to break. And by September, Bolivia, Chile, and Uruguay had all broken, and the only country remaining with diplomatic and commercial relations with Cuba, and which never broke, was Mexico. In the few minutes uh, remaining uh, that I have, I want to... Um, Testigo Philip. Yes. Please. Please. Eh, sus argumentos son muy sólidos y, son, y dan muchísima información. You have provided a lot of information on your work and the CIA's uh, work. But, as you know, we have very little time. How long did you spend working for the CIA? 
I was working for the CIA since mid 1957 up until until the end of 1968 devoted to Cuba only years in the work against Cuba it was difficult your job with Cuba says the prosecutor now says the witness it's very difficult and I say it with pride and Cuba was the reason that for me to be in part of the CIA it, it was very funny you know you have ups and downs in life and at the age of 22 I came from Tampa Florida my native hometown not far from Cuba I visited I was abroad for the first time I was a college graduate and I love so much the Cuban culture, the people, the dance, the music, the food, everything. Then I went back to the U.S. and I just thought, well, I, I, the, the, the CIA tried to recruit me when I was concluding my university studies, but I rejected. But when I went back to Tampa, I wondered. It was a, such a good life, an exotic sort of life. I wrote a letter to the CIA. They sent me the applications. And six months afterwards, I was in the CIA. And then, an exhausting sort of job, thanks God. It was difficult, right? It was a difficult job, very difficult for you. Yes, as a witness, the, the, the Cuban target was a difficult one because the ideological and political level of the Q people working within the revolution, I was never here, stationed in Havana, uh, working against Cuba, but rather against Cuba's office representative abroad. And uh, we were all aware of the fact that it was very difficult. The main target was the security forces, the Cuban security forces. We knew that they were very, very effective. And all along those years, we tried to penetrate the security forces to recruit the members of the security forces and no success. Now says the uh, president of the trial, a witness, your thoughts and your analysis and your ideas have been broadly disseminated, right? So every peace-loving pe person have informed of your ideas on that topic that is the dirty job made by the CIA. I wanted to inform you that uh, Philip has given us this uh, journal, there are a few that have been distributed known as cover, ac cover action. I think it's a very good uh, publication because uh, there are articles and it's being published in the US. And this specific uh, one is spring 1997. It has two great articles. One of a human sort that makes a relationship between the production of uh, bombs, age bombs, five billions yearly, and how could this be used to cure or to heal uh, AIDS. There's another article which is part of the cover, is the textbook repression on the part of the U.S. government and training handbook, a training handbook uh, to terrorist forces and tortures. And this handbook was used to train lots of uh, henchmen in our America. Phillips, in the course of our festival, you will have another space or other spaces to make your present your charges. They will be very much welcomed by the Cuban people and by all peace-loving persons in the world. I would thank you very much for being here in this uh, court. I thank you, Phillips. If you allow me, if the courts allow me, 
I would like to announce to inform you that at 1.30 this afternoon in room 12 downstairs is a press conference uh, room. I'm going to be there. So anyone willing to go to room 12 to deal with the terrorism and the CIA, I'll do that with pleasure. I'm sure that the CIA is active in the Puerto Rican independence movement. Estoy seguro de que la CIA está activa dentro, de, o sea, trabajando contra el movimiento independentista puertorriqueño. If for no other reason that Cuba supports the independence of Puerto Rico. Y todos saben de que lo que Cuba eh, eh, apoya el movimiento independentista puertorriqueño. So that's a reason enough for the CIA to be involved. Of course, we know a lot about the FBI's repressive activities in Puerto Rico. And also of the military in Puerto Rico. And I think the picture you get is pretty clear. I was not involved directly in CIA activities in Argentina, unfortunately. <laughs> I say unfortunately because I can tell you about them. <laughs> but what we were doing in Montevideo was very closely related to Argentina. And I'm speaking of around 1963-1964. This is a period in which the left-wing Peronists were, were, were being persecuted and repressed in Argentina. And so we had some of the, uh, quite a few in fact, uh, Argentine exiles in Montevideo. And we were penetrating this exile organization like the CIA penetrates exile organizations all over the world. In order to collect information for the Buenos Aires station. One of the principal um, Peronist exiles was an Argentine journalist whose name was, I believe, Julio Gallego Soto. And he was at the center of all of the exile activities. And, and he was one, one of their links with Cuba. Argentina had broken diplomatic relations with Cuba. And the Cuban embassy in Montevideo was responsible for Argentine matters. <coughs> and the Cuban embassy in Montevideo was responsible for Argentine matters. <laughs> we put a, uh, a listening device in the apartment of this journalist. And he used this apartment uh, for his meetings with all the other Argentine exiles that were there. And so the information we got was uh, extremely important. Around 1964, these Argentines were going back to, um, to uh, Buenos Aires. But the best information that the CIA had up until then on the left wing, on the left wing Peronist movement was from this uh, operation in Montevideo. Was from this operation in Montevideo. On the Oganilla coup, I think 67. Um, 
I can't tell you if there was a CIA hand in that. No, no, no puedo de que la CIA, o sea, las manos de la CIA ya No tengo In many cases, uh, because of the yeah, because of the instability of Latin American politics, there may be a a golpe or coup d'état at one point, and many people will think that the CIA was involved. En muchos eh, pueden pensarse de que se han dado golpes de estado por ahí y que la CIA ha estado involucrada en ella. But there's also a political dynamic. Pero hay dinámicas políticas. In which events develop having nothing to do with the CIA. Eh, donde hay algunos de, la, de las cuestiones que suceden que realmente no no tienen que estar la que no tienen que estar la CIA presente. But speaking of Argentina, I would pero, I would mention the uh, guerrilla movement of Salta of 1963-64. Pero eh, hablando sobre Argentina, quiero hablar sobre un poco sobre el movimiento guerrillero de Salta. Many people don't know that Che, by 1962, Che Guevara, by 1962, had decided to go back to Argentina. En el 1962, muchas, muchas, muchas personas no desconocían de que el Che quería volver a Argentina en el 1962. His idea was to create a continent-wide revolutionary movement, armed revolutionary movement. Con, eh, desarrollar un movimiento eh, continental eh, revolucionario. He recruited Argentines and trained them here in Cuba. Argentinos y los entrenó aquí en Cuba. The first group was under the leadership of Jorge Massetti. El primer grupo se, se hizo bajo la dirección de Jorge Massetti. Who's very well known as the founder of Pensa Latina. Uh, quien fue, como todos conocen, uh, muy, muy conocido en el fundador de Prensa Latina. Without the knowledge of the CIA, without detection by the CIA, Massetti and the others uh, infiltrated through Brazil to Bolivia. No, 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 uh, Brazil to Bolivia. Brazil to Bolivia. And on the, uh, the, uh, the frontier, the border with uh, Argentina, they had a base camp at a farm in, on the Bolivian side of the river. Y en, ellos tenían un campamento en el, la frontera entre Bolivia y Argentina. Argentina. And when the Massetti group began to go out on their excursions, this base camp was under the command of Furri. Eh, en aquella etapa, esta, esta, este campamento fue eh, dirigido, ¿no? liderado por un señor llamado Furri. That was his... Uh, nom de guerra. His ese es el nombre eh, de guerra que llevaba eh, ese líder guerrillero. He was Cuban. Era cubano. He was the former chief of police in Havana. Él fue el ex el jefe de la policía en La Habana. And he's now the minister of the interior right now. Y es ahora el ministro del interior de. But he fought with the Machete, Massetti group in y Argentina. Y él luchó junto con Massetti en aquella en aquel momento. Massetti's group made a number of mistakes. Massetti hizo una serie de, o sea, tuvo una serie de errores. And Che's plan was to come with a second group once Massetti's group had established the proper conditions. El objetivo de Che era crear primero que este grupo eh, tuviera eh, ya basificado y después posteriormente entrar junto con el grupo de Massetti. The Argentine Security, security Service, known as uh, DEEP. El Servicio Argentino infiltrated two agents into the Massetti group. And I'm pretty sure that they were working with the CIA to infiltrate these. And the period I'm speaking of is late 1963, early 1964. Because of tactical mistakes, Massetti's group was also discovered or detected by the rural police in uh, Salta. O sea, también eh, por cuestiones ya tácticas, de errores tácticos, el grupo de Massetti también fue detectado por la policía rural. And by April 19, Salta. and by April 1964, the group was completely uh, dispersed and defeated. Eh, el grupo fue eh, detectado y además de eso dispersado y se acabó. There were there were about 18 prisoners taken by the Argentine police. 
por la policía argentina. But there were two who escaped. Dos escaparon. One was Ciro Bustos, who later would be with Che in Bolivia. Uno fue Ciro Bustos, que continuó después la guerrilla de Bolivia. And the other one was Furri, the Cuban. Y el otro Cuban. fue Furri. They Cuban. arrived in Montevideo. Ellos regresaron a Montevideo. And this was precisely when I had just arrived in Montevideo. Y es el mismo momento en que yo llegaba a la punta de la punta de la estación de la ciudad de Montevideo. And it was my job to detect and capture them. Y eh, uno de los, de los objetivos que me habían dado era eh, detectarlos y capturarlos. And I never knew they were there. Y nunca se los que eran. In addition, there was a secret Cuban arms cache in Uruguay, of which I knew nothing about, but it was there. Hubo uh, un, un escondrijo especial, ¿no? Eh, que tenían un puerto, eh, eh, los cubanos lo tenían en, en Montevideo y que tampoco los pude detectar. No, they had it in Uruguay, not necessarily. Uh, en Uruguay, en Uruguay, no sabe dónde, pero era en Uruguay. This shipment of arms was destined originally for Salta. Este, este cargamento de armas eh, estaba um, dirigido a llevarlo al, al campamento de Salta. But on orders from Havana, I think from Che. Uh, pero por órdenes de La Habana, que él piensa que sea uh, Che Guevara. This arm cache was divided by Ciro Bustos, the Argentine. Este, eh, este cargamento de armas fue eh, llevado por Ciro, o sea, se lo llevó Ciro Bustos. One part was given to another Argentine group that was going to start a guerrilla movement in Tucumán. Una parte fue entregado a un otro grupo guerrillero que se iba a comenzar también en Tucumán. The other part of the arm cache was given to Raúl Sendik. Y la otra parte fue dado a Raúl Sendik. Who at that, that form was just beginning to form the uh, National Liberation Movement uh, Tucumanos, which we en know so momento, much about later. En ese momento, Sendik estaba formando, iniciando el movimiento del Movimiento de Liberación Nacional Tupac Amar. En la CIA, no, no, Tupac Amar. Tupac Amar, Tupac Amar. Y we knew nothing of this, absolutely nothing. Y realmente de eso desconocíamos todo. They did it right under our noses, you know. Sí, realmente lo hicieron debajo de nuestras narices. But then in the 1980s, I'm sure the CIA, but in the 1980s, the CIA certainly was working very closely with the military governments of that period. I'm sorry, I meant from the 1970s until the fall of the military government after the Malvinas uh, war. Después de la, de la guerra de las Malvinas, ¿no? Eh, antes, eh, antes, antes, antes de la, de la guerra de las Malvinas, entre el 70 y el 80. Uh, you wanted to ask a question, man. I'm a Marxist Leninist of Belgium. Soy un marxista leninista de Bélgica. Uh, a report of the Rand Corporation, an annex of the CIA, explains the different tactics to attack the socialism in Cuba. Un reporte de la Rand Corporation. De la Rand Corporation. Hablaba de eh, acciones contra Cuba. Yes. Uh, this report speaks about the embargo and also about the another tax tactics. Uh, sí, este reporte hablaba sobre el embargo y otras tácticas. The necessity of a political revolution against Fidel Castro. Y la necesidad de la supuesta eh, eh, revolución política contra Fidel Castro. In a Trotskyist newspaper, have we read that the people? Periódico Trotskista. Have we read that the people must do a revolution against the bureaucratic power of Fidel Castro to save the socialism? Bureaucratic, 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 power of Fidel Castro. Power, power, power. O sea, que en el periódico. Eh, expresan ¿no? de que se debe de hacer una revolución en contra del poder eh, de Fidel Castro. For you, uh, what will be the consequences for Cuba of a revolution against Fidel Castro? A new socialism or the return of the capitalism? Eh, para usted, ¿qué usted piensa? Si se va, eh, si se debe hacer una revolución o ir a una revolución socialista o continuar la, o sea, haciendo una revolución socialista o ir 
eh, o si se irá hacia el capitalismo. Another example is in the fall of uh, the Union Sovietic. Um, uh, Trotskyist write in the newspaper. Uh, en, en, la Unión so en Rusia. En, la, en, en Rusia se habla los troquistas plantean en un periódico that Gorbachev and then Yeltsin go to the democracy. Que Gorbachev y Yeltsin van hacia la democracia. Now we see what happens here in Russia. Y ahora vemos lo que sucede en Rusia. The support of Gorbachev and Yeltsin is the support of the return of the capitalism. Eh, que el, el apoyo, o sea, el mantener a Gorbachev y a Yeltsin es ir hacia el capitalismo. Don't you believe that objectively what the Trotskyists say have the say, same consequences that CIA say? Eh, que si eh, usted cree que las consecuencias que plantean los troquistas eh, coinciden con la, con la visión que tiene la CIA. It looks like we've returned to the beginning. <laughs> I've been coming to Cuba regularly for more than 25 years now. And I read about Cuba every day through my computer. My feeling is that uh, there's not a an imminent da danger of counter-revolution in Cuba. Imminent. Cuba is a very different country from Eastern Europe. Cuba es una, un país distinto a la Europa Oriental. It has a colorful and very interesting history. Tiene una eh, historia muy interesante y muy, muy interesante. Interesante. And uh, it goes back really to, um, in the modern times, to the wars of independence in Latin America. Y va muy atrás hacia las guerras de independencia de América Latina. The United States, as it supported the independence of the rest of Latin America, did not want to see Cuba independent. Los Estados Unidos apoyó en aquel entonces algunas independencias de los distintos países latinoamericanos, sin embargo, la de Cuba no la apoyaron. And for all of the 19th century, Cuba was fighting for its independence, either in arms or in, in politics. Y en el siglo XIX, durante todo el tiempo ese que Cuba estaba luchando por su independencia. And so when they finally have the war against Spain won, the United States intervenes. Eh, y finalmente, cuando ya se estaba ganando la guerra contra los españoles, ellos intervienen. And then there's a whole series of puppet governments here until 1959. Y eh, después hubo una serie de gobiernos títeres, ¿no? Desde, desde el... So you have a uh, 200 years of nationalism at play here. O sea, 200 años de nacionalismo. Estamos hablando de alrededor de 200 años de nacionalismo. And especially in the shadow of the United States. Y especialmente en la sombra o con la sombra de los Estados Unidos. Because of this special history and because of the Cuban people as they are, I don't see any indication at all that uh, counter-revolution is in the foreseeable future. This, in this doesn't make it any easier for Cubans, though. And last night in a conversation, I was saying that the old refrain, um, so popular in Mexico, would apply just as well to Cuba, if not better. And that's the old saying, poor Mexico, so far from God, and so close to the United States. Pobre México, tan cerca de Dios, no tan lejos de Dios y tan cerca de Estados Unidos. But that can apply very well to Cuba too. Y esto puede aplicarse muy bien a Cuba. Yes.
Can you, can you talk a little bit louder, please? Why? Right. Uh, in my language, it's like you have to be like a Latin American or something. All of America. In all of America. Including the United States. There's a rich history of colonialism. And what occurred, you know, after Spain and France and England, they sort of lost some, lost some of their power. O sea, eh, durante, durante todos estos tiempos, o sea, los años de historia que hemos visto, ¿no? o sea, eh, España, Inglaterra, etc., han perdido los imperios. Control you know, uh, all, all the Americas, the United States. Han controlado todos todo los países de América Latina, etc. Con un poder internacional. Sí, han ido quitando a todos estos gobiernos, a todos estos países, han ido quitando la... Y han ido aumentando el poder. países eh, entre ellos para tratar de ocupar eh, los lugares en distintos países. Yeah, I think I do. It depends on the first of all the questions I understand it is that you'd like for me to comment on the potential and actual conflicts between the United States and other developed countries. Rich countries. Una, uh, with respect to exploitation of the third world. La, la, la pregunta es el conflicto existente entre Estados Unidos y otras naciones desarrolladas con relación a los países por los cuales ellos están interesados. Por ejemplo, fundamentalmente los países del tercer mundo. It depends on the historical moment. Todo depende del momento histórico. You remember the Monroe Doctrine. Recuerda la doctrina de Monroe. This was a United States policy announced by President Monroe just as Latin American countries were getting their freedom from Spain. The United States feared that other European powers than Spain would now try to recolonize parts of Latin America. Eh, los norteamericanos temían, ¿no? De que would try to recolonize ah, parts sí, of Latin America. Que eh, temían, they feared. They feared. Sí, temían de que iban a tratar de recolonizar otra vez eh, estos países que se estaban independizando. And I'm referring mainly to Great Britain. Eh, fundamentalmente Inglaterra. The Monroe Doctrine said that 
Latin America or the Western Hemisphere is no longer open for colonization from Europe. O sea, la doctrina Monroe, la idea que, que el objetivo que perseguía era expresar de que eh, para Europa no había América Latina, no había América. And this was just after uh, President Madison had also Esto fue a partir de, fue del presidente Madison stated his views toward United States policy with respect to Cuba. Que fue también una, uh, o sea, en la cual él dirigía también la política con relación a Cuba. This is the concept of the ripe fruit. El concepto de la fruta madura. Madison had said, it's not necessary for Cuba to have independence now. Cuba is like a ripening, ripening fruit on the limb of the tree. Eh, este Madison planteó de que eh, no era necesario, o sea, que, que no era necesario la independencia de Cuba y que, además de eso, que era una fruta madura eh, ya expuesta ya y que iba a caer sola. And when it did fall from the tree, it would fall into its proper natural order under direction of the United States. Y que lo que caería, caería... Um, Dentro, de los, dentro, de la, de, de, dentro del poder de los propios Estados Unidos. By the 1970s, Cuba had far more United States investment. That's the 1870s. Far more United States investment, direct investment, than any other country of the world. En el 1870, eh, Estados Unidos tenía la mayor cantidad de inversiones en Cuba que en otros lugares del mundo. And this was the justification for intervention in 1898. De la intervención. The old story of protecting U.S. lives and property. La, 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 la vieja historia, ¿no? De eh, proteger los bienes y las vidas de los norteamericanos. But now the question of competition with the European powers. Pero bueno, ahora la pregunta que hacía sobre la competencia entre las naciones europeas o In, la, la, sí, las naciones europeas, la poderosa. Yeah. In the 1890s, the frontier in the United States was closed. In the 1898s, there was no more open frontier in the United States for Western, Western expansion. No había nueva expansión en el 1890. During the 1890s, the United States experienced the worst economic depression of its history until that moment. Tuvo el momento de depresión económica más grande it was then that the leadership in the United States, let's say the political class, understood that the United States would never be able to consume inside the country all that it produced. And that for this reason, Prosperity in the United States and the survival of the system there depended on foreign markets. From there comes the open door policy that we all learn about at an early period. Students in the United States, I mean. You will find this open door policy continuing today. If you pick up any newspaper published in the United States, under another name, of course. But it's still a recognition that the United States system depends on the exploitation of foreign markets. And this, is where, and this is where the question of competition with other imperialist powers comes in. Principally, Britain, France, Germany, and to a lesser extent, Spain. The reality is that the United States, for its own internal prosperity, and therefore the, sal the um, survival of the system, depends on the exploitation of foreign markets. La realidad es que la supervivencia del sistema depende del de mercado exterior. Labor, 
Markets, labor, and natural resources. Those three things. De los recursos naturales, de recursos naturales en el exterior, de un mercado de trabajo externo también y además de eso, de los mercados externos. And this is. Eso depende del sistema norteamericano. And access to the natural resources, the. Y acceso a esos recursos naturales.